Doug Sillers. Um, thanks for the great introduction. Um, I'm from the United States, and so my Romanian is nil. Um, so I'm going to speak in English, and I hope that's okay. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about mobile performance, uh, both native apps and web apps. We'll talk a little bit about both. I'll switch back and forth. Um, what we're looking at is sort of how these apps work on the network and how the inner, how the network traffic of these of web and native apps affects the performance of your apps. And so, to start off with a random question: Walking out on a walkway like this out in the mountains, how many of you get like a pit in your stomach thinking, just thinking about walking out on this like metal thing, looking down thousands of feet? Right? It's a little terrifying. So last year, Ericsson did a study, and in this study. They asked, how stressful is it when you stand in line? And that actually is like 0.6 on their mark is like, that's pretty stressful. Standing on the edge of the virtual cliff, really, really stressful for people. That's scary. But when your mobile app is slow, it's even more stressful. <laughs> right? So that feeling you get in the pit of your stomach, like, right? When your app, when the app is slow, that's what your customers feel. And then, you know, we can make jokes about how math is hard or something for the last <laughs> one, but uh, what's most important is just like people get really frustrated when apps or native experiences are slow. So Google did a study and they found that, and this is ad, so when somebody clicks on a, a Google ad, they found that if it takes over three seconds to load, 53% of people just hit back and don't follow the page load, they give up. Um, they did a study where they put sensors on people's brains and they found that for every 500 milliseconds of delay, people got more frustrated and less engaged with the website they were loading. In 2001, both Walmart and Amazon s showed that for every 100 milliseconds, they lost 1% of revenue, and that's desktop. And you have to figure it's at least that on mobile. That they would lose, they, people weren't buying as much stuff. And obviously, when you're building a, a, a e-commerce e website, that's kind of your goal. Um, and, but my most favorite stat of all time is that 4% of people admit to throwing their phone when a website is slow. So when you see somebody walking on the street with a cracked phone, <clears throat> that might be why. Um, so this tweet came up um, while I was building the deck. And I should have been working on my deck, but I was reading Twitter. It happens, right? Um, but what he's graphing here is he's showing the number of people at different load times. So this is zero seconds, seven seconds, 10 seconds. These are the number of people, how fast it took for those people for the page to load. And this is the percentage of people who bounced, who didn't walk, who didn't stay in. And 50% is right about here. So if you look, it's right in that three second range. So it's right in what Google was saying. There's a lot of other really neat things here. You can see that there's probably a different, couple different modal distributions here, like maybe this is desktop and maybe that's mobile, and we'll get to that later. But you know, this is just another piece of data that I saw when I was slacking on my deck. Um, but what the, the summary of all that is that our customers demand immersive, rich, and fast, immersive, immersive and rich experiences that are also fast. And those are often very hard to do at the same time. And so I want to walk through some of the steps that we can do to make that happen. One of the problems is, is cellular networks are high latency. And so you may have noticed, like if you're reading an article and then you click a link, it may take a second for something to happen before it feels like the phone does anything. And that's because it takes time for the phone to talk to the tower to establish a connection before packets can even go. And on 3G, it can be up to two and a half seconds. So if you're on 3G, you'll actually see that pretty profoundly. And then the other thing that you'll see is that there's a much larger round trip time. And that's just because of all the infrastructure that has to go through, through towers and backhaul through the cellular network and things. So it ends up taking a lot longer for files to go back and forth onto a mobile device. And then you can see on Wi-Fi, it's generally really, really fast. So if people on Wi-Fi don't see a lot of this high latency, but when people are on cellular, they will see that. This is a screenshot from a tool that we have at AT&T called Video Optimizer. I'll talk about it in a little bit. But what we do is we gather all the packets. We capture all the packets that are transmitted when an app is running. And we model what the radio does. And so you can see there's this startup delay right here. And because it's so slow to start up that connection, the cellular network keeps the radio on after the last packet is sent. And the idea there is 
let's avoid this big delay by keeping the radio on. You don't want to keep it on forever because then your phone dies, right? We're always plugging, my phone's plugged in over here because my battery's almost dead. Um, but we keep it on for a period of five or 10 seconds to in anticipation of future packets. This can be really good, but it can also be bad if I've seen mobile apps that keep sending a keep alive every 15 seconds. And when you send a keep alive every 15 seconds, the radio doesn't turn off and then turn on 15 seconds later. The radio just stays on the whole time. And you could just watch the, the little indicator of the battery just, you know, quickly go away. So it's something that, that you should think about. It, it's not something that developers know about. This is something that like packet core people at AT&T think about. And I didn't know about it until somebody told me about it. So what I want to do today is talk about tools that you can use to test your site or your app. What can you do to see where you are today? Let's look at some best practices for speed and learn from existing tests that I've run on different apps and best practices that people have come up with. And then we can see the results of some of those performance fixes because I'll walk through some of the things that I've seen while I've been working with developers. And so one of my jobs is to give talks like this, but I also test applications like Facebook and Netflix and the apps on your phone and then talk to them and say, hey, do you want to make your app run faster? And in the seven years I've been doing that, I've had three companies say, no, I don't want my app to be faster. I don't know why they didn't want their app to be faster, but they didn't want to talk to me. Everybody else has been really interested. So the tool I work on at AT&T uh, is called Video Optimizer, and it runs network traces of all the traffic coming in out of the phone and then analyzes it, and I'll talk about that in a second. For web, have any of you used web page tests in the past? Have you heard of web page tests? It's a really cool tool for testing both desktop and mobile web um, websites. And so I'll talk a little bit about that too. Um, so Video Optimizer, what it lets you do is you can test iOS or Android. Um, you can, you know, you plug your phone into your computer. And I've got it all set up here if, you, if anyone wants to see a, a demo later. Um, you can change the speed. And why that's interesting is we get, there's 4G here, right? I get 4G in Seattle, but other places, there's still only 3G or 2G, and you may want to see what um, your application looks like on those slower networks. At Facebook, they have 2G Tuesdays, where they throttle the, the Wi-Fi network for all the cell phones down to 2G, so people can see how horrible Facebook looks on 2G. <laughs> it's really slow. Um, but it's important, and that's why they have things like Facebook Lite now which is important for those areas of the world that don't have, that don't want auto-playing video and all of those things that Facebook does that would really not work on 2G. And then you can do all sorts of other stuff. You can record the screen while you're doing it so you can see what's happening. And then you get a result. And so while it's running, it looks like this. And so this is what's on my computer. And what happens is a VPN gets set up on your phone. And when there's a VPN, we can set up a man in the middle and collect all the packets. And then when you're done, you hit stop. And then what we do is instead of opening up in Wireshark or other network analysis tools, we grade it. And we try to give you 40 best practices. And red X's are bad, and green check marks are good. And so we try to make it really easy to figure out where the areas are that you can improve your mobile application for performance issues. And I'm going to walk through some examples that I've seen. Um, I've seen just about everything happen with this application over the last seven years. I've seen my password go by in the clear. Um, I've, it, it's wild. Um, and so, the, you know, I didn't think we would have security best practices, and then I saw my password go by in the clear, and I'm like, we need a security best practice. And then I started seeing um, 404 errors, and I'm like, we need to look for file not found, because you can, you know, just like you can screw up an image in your web page, you can mess it up in your mobile app. And, um, so we, we've just grown based on what we've seen, and we've started adding a lot of video because, as we all know, the web and apps are really going video. And it's if you think about what uses the most amount of data for customers, it's video. So if we can help make that more efficient, that's really great for all of our customers. The second tool I want to talk about is Web Page Test, and it's a it's also open source. But there's this you can go to webpagetest.org. You enter the website. You can set your test location, so they have devices all over the world, so you can test the, how it looks in different parts of the world. But in Virginia, they have, actually the guy who runs it in his basement, he has a bank of phones. 
And so you can test, like here I tested a Moto G4 on Chrome, and it has every browser, so you can test almost any type of device, any type of browser to see how the web page will work. And then you can see, you can load it and see what happens. And when you're done, you get things like load time. And so remember that tweet I showed you that said it took, it takes seven seconds for this page to load on mobile, at least in the test that I did. Um, and it gives you a waterfall. So this is, each row here is a file that's being requested and it shows how long it takes for all of those things to load so you can understand page load time in your mobile application, in your mobile website. Um, so I'm gonna talk first a little bit about delivery speed. And so I live here in Washington State and a couple of years ago I bought a package from here in Canada. And I was like, oh, that's great. I'm gonna get it really, really quickly. But then they sent it FedEx and so it went to Tennessee before it came to me in Washington. And so there's a lot of inefficient delivery, even in mobile or on websites. And so this is sort of my example of like, it happens in real life too. Um, so I wrote a blog post about crypto jacking. Have you guys, have you heard of crypto jacking? So it's people insert JavaScript onto websites and they mine cryptocurrency in the background. And so on Black Friday, like, all of these websites got hit with this crypto jacking software and your laptop just goes up to 100% CPU because in the background it's trying to mine cryptocurrency. And like they got like 2,500 websites and it was all through Black Friday, which is of course the big shopping day. And the estimate is they made like 47 cents in cryptocurrency with all of that, because these are not really very efficient. <laughs> and on your phone, it's horribly inefficient. But I was looking at this site, because this is the coin, coin Hive is the most common one, where it was a few months ago. And they only have one server in Germany. So if you ping that server from around the world, you can see it takes 10 milliseconds to ping that ser server if you're in Munich. But if you're in San Jose or Singapore, you know it takes a long time for, the speed of light is really, really fast but it's still, there's still a latency if, you're, if, if you have to go halfway around the world. And so I collected this with a tool called Zirconius, and so it just pings, and it monitors websites in different parts of the world as you set it up. And so, for example, you know, like my package that went all the way to Tennessee, this is going back and forth all, halfway around the world. So one thing you can do if you have a mobile website or a mobile app is you can use a CDN. And what a CDN does is all of your files, <clears throat> when a request comes through, it goes through the CDN. If it's not there, it goes all the way back to your server. But then it caches it locally in Seattle or in Brazil or in Sydney. So the next person from Australia, it doesn't have to come all the way back to Romania, it's here in Sydney. So it's a very, very fast response time or Seattle or wherever the next person who hits it. And it speeds up those round trip times because it doesn't have to travel as many thousands of miles. Um, another thing that I've seen, and going back to this, this graph that I showed, and as I showed you, uh, when I did it, when I loaded this page in web page test with a, with a Android phone, it took about seven seconds for it to load. And so I, I tested it with web page test, and you can see it takes seven seconds. But one thing that's really interesting is it does a redirect. So if you type in CSS wizardry, it redirects you to the HTTPS version of the website. About 60% of the internet does this now, right? This is a good thing, but it adds another 960 milliseconds of delay for the page to load. And so the time to first byte, it actually took about 2.2 seconds for the first data to arrive before the page could render. The page rendered pretty quickly afterwards, but there's this initial delay right here, which is pretty significant. And that ends up giving them, in web page test, an F for the time for first byte. But, like I said, this happens to a lot of people. You may have heard of this company, right? And Google has two redirects. The first time you hit the site, it redirects to www Google, and then it redirects you to HTTPS. This is all cache, so the second time you go, there's only one redirect. But um, you can see that that ends up taking, the first time you visit this website, it takes almost two seconds before it actually starts even downloading the file that you need. And another cool thing that's in web page test is you can take a, you can take a video 
and see what it looks like when the page loads. And I'm doing this, I didn't test it on this computer, so we'll see if it works. It's not good enough. All right. But there was a video here. We switched <laughs> machines because I couldn't get my machine to talk to the overhead, the projector thing. But that was a video of Google loading. You've seen it before. <laughs> just imagine in your head, but just imagine that it took about two and a half seconds before anything showed up on the screen, and then very quickly the little box in the middle and the, the logo thing at the top showed up. Um, so the other thing I want to talk about is content delivery, and this is actually really important too. And I don't know if this happens, so Amazon, I'm from Seattle, and so Amazon is huge in Seattle, it's based there. And everybody jokes about how Amazon packages things. You'll buy something and you get this big box on the front of your, you know, on your front doorstep, and it's this little thing, and then there's, this, there's bubble wrap everywhere else. Like they send you this enormous box, and there's nothing in it, and except for this little tiny bit. And the same analogy holds for a lot of the content that's sent on over the internet, and we'll walk through that really, really quickly. Um, <clears throat> this is data collected from web page tests. So there's a tool called the HTTP Archive, and every two weeks they test the top million websites with this tool. And you, there's actually, it's, there's a big query, so you can do SQL queries and learn about what the web is doing today and compare it to a year ago or two years ago. Um, but let's look at the different types of files. We've got about 25% of the files are text files, right? 50% um, of the average web page are images, and then 25% is video. And so let's break it down. I'm going to talk a little bit about each three of these categories. Um, this is an app I tested with Video Optimizer. And it's a video app, right? These are all videos that we'll be able to play, but it's, it's still loading. So you can see there are all these placeholders, sort of that skeleton framework. Um, nothing's loaded yet, but you can see stuff is going to be there soon. Um, this screen is populated through a JSON file. So the app requests a JSON file from the server. It's downloaded. And the JSON file is 130 kilobytes. Now the problem with that file, well, and so this file has stuff like the title, America's Got Talent, and then it has the image URL and it gives you the link to the image, so that image can populate right here. Now the thing is this 130 kilobytes isn't compressed. So if you compress it, it's going to be smaller. If it's smaller, it downloads faster. If it downloads faster, this request for the image can be made faster, and this screen populates faster, making a faster experience for the customer. So if we take this uncompressed file and we gzip it, which is a you know, common way of compressing files, it becomes 16 kilobytes. Broadly, is it, have you guys heard of Broadly? Yeah. yeah, okay, so it's the Google, a new Google text compression. It's supposed to take a little bit longer to compress the files, but there's a little controversy about that. Some people still think Broadly is almost as fast as Gzip. But it's 12 kilobytes. So I mean, you can save a lot of data. That's obviously going to download a lot faster than this. And that will make for a faster experience for your customers. Um, and, and makes, you know, you're not saving that much data, but what you're doing is you're speeding up the experience of the application. Um, and if we go back to that archive of all of the data, we can actually look and see here are different size files from 2 kilobytes up to 100 kilobytes text files. You know, most of the files are sent with gzip. Um, Rotley is down here. For some reason, about this range, there are a lot of Rotley files. And then there's, you know, a number of files that aren't compressed at all. And what we can do is we can actually look how long did it take those files to download. And what we can see is that files that aren't compressed take a lot longer to download, even if they're the same size as the files that, um, even at the same size. So this is, a five, this is a 10K not compressed, this is 10K compressed, and it still takes longer. So it makes sense to compress these files because it downloads faster and leads to faster experiences, both for the web and um, for native. Uh, sometimes people ask, how long does it take to uncompress files? Like if you download it, how long does that decompression take? And it's the, the data that I've seen, and it's about three years old, is it's under a millisecond. So it's nothing compared to the, the transit time of these files over the network. The next thing I want to talk about is images. And images are obviously a huge place because just about every website and every app use images. And if you look, it's a huge percentage of what's used <clears throat> on the mobile web. 
And so this is an app that I tested with Video Optimizer. It's a movie app. And this file of, of this actor is, is 30 kilobytes. But it had EXIF data. Do you guys know EXIF data? So you know it has all this Photoshop stuff that's in there. And it's actually 5 kilobytes. And as a user of a mobile app or as a user of a website, you don't care about that. You just want the image to show up. And so you could actually make that image 16% smaller. And most tools that you know you use to upload content to web servers actually strip out a lot of the EXIF data for this very reason. Um, and Photoshop is actually pretty renowned for doing pretty hairy things to the EXIF data, like they actually put thumbnails in there. So there's actually an image in the metadata, which can obviously drive up the size of that file that nobody actually knows is there. Um, and so here's that. Here's another movie application that I was testing, and I was looking at uh, you know movies that had that Frank Sinatra was in. And so this is my phone, you know this phone right here, and it's 1440 pixels by uh, 2560 pixels. <clears throat> and I'm going to look at this image that's sort of half loaded here on the screen. And I did this with Video Optimizer. So this is a screenshot from when I was doing the test last week. And Video Optimizer looks at all the files that are downloaded, and it found this image being downloaded. And if you look, it's a lot bigger than it needs to be, right, in terms of pixels. Um, so this original file is actually 1.5 megabytes. So to download this file to show up here in this little corner it took 1.5 megabytes, which can obviously take a lot of time. <clears throat> and if you're not on an unlimited data plan, it can actually cost you a lot of your data. So what can we do to make that image more optimized? What if it's taking up half the screen here, half of you know, 1440 is 720, right? We're just doing some arithmetic here. If I resize it in, um, I, I used, you know, what is it, preview on my Mac, right? I just resized it and saved it. And it's that size. And it gets 76% smaller. That's pretty easy. That's a great win. Um, but I think we can do better than that. So what about image quality? And so image quality, you've probably seen it like when in, and you know, I can't tell. I can't tell if you can see this is a little jaggy here just because of the, the, the number of pixels on the, on, the, on the screen here. But you'll see images that are a little more jaggy. You know, the edges, aren't, the, the edges aren't as rounded because the, uh, the number of pixels have been reduced. You, you, you'll see that the images don't look very good. But what if we just make, save this image at JPEG 85%? And I just pulled that out of thin air. I think Google recommended 85% at one point, just as sort of like a most of the time it's pretty good, sometimes it's not so good, sometimes it's way more than it needs to be, but it was just a number that was thrown out there. So if I save that at 85% quality, you can't tell a difference. Um, the only way you can tell a difference is this is the same, this is the first image, and that's the second image. But you can, it's, it's the the down here, right? And you can see, obviously, you know, it's, it's definitely, is jaggier, right? It's, it's definitely not as smooth. But when you reduce it down to that size, eh, nobody's going to know anyway. Um, so if we do that at 85% quality, we save 64%. But now we can reduce the pixels and the quality, right? Do both. And we've made the file 10% the size it was before. And so, you know, I just did this with, you know, um, Photoshop and with preview on my <clears throat> on my uh, on my Mac so you can do this manually it's pretty easy to do um, the trick is of course when you build a website or you build an app you probably have thousands and thousands of images and you don't want to do this sort of thing manually um, it would just take forever and of course the uh, let's see here okay so one thing you can do is there's a tool called Cloudinary and what it does is it allows you to take an image, the big Frank Sinatra image, and you can just put parameters in there. So you can programmatically put parameters in there. So if you're on a smaller phone, you can change the width to whatever number you want that to be. If you're on a tablet, you can make it bigger. If you're on a desktop, you can do whatever you want. And so what I did is I, I started playing with Cloudinary. And one thing I did is 
the last image I had was quality 85%, and I just threw out that number, right? Seems like a good number. I use quality auto, and what they use is they use something that compares the images to find the best um, quality that no one will notice the change in quality. And so there are a bunch of different tools that will do that, that, that so that the human eye cannot discern a difference. And it actually looks like it goes down to a lower quality because we're down even smaller by changing the quality. And then there are all sorts of other really cool transformations that, that Cloudinary will let you do. The last one I did is I saved it as a WebP because I'm on Android and WebP is supported as an image format. Um, JPEG is from the 80s. It hasn't changed much since the 80s. It's still a great format. It's used like everywhere. But if you can use WebP on Android, it's now 5% the size that it was when I started this whole journey of the image, right? 84 kilobytes, it's going to download really, really fast compared to one and a half megabytes. Um, and so, you know, it's just a cool way of doing this. And obviously, it's, you can change it programmatically, which is a really nice thing. And the other thing is they have a CDN, so all of that speed stuff that I mentioned earlier, they take care of a lot of that for you, too. So the part that I was getting to that's really hard is this is data from December from Akamai. How many mobile browsers using Chrome hit Akamai in two days? And it's a lot of different devices. And so the size of the box is how many of that type of device hit. So there are a bunch of Samsungs right here. But as you can see, there are a lot of mobile devices out there, and they all have different sizes. And it gets really complicated to figure out how to um, decide what sizes to deliver to, to mobile devices. Um, and so I could give a whole talk on responsive images, and I have a demo over here, but it's on the wrong computer, so I can show it to you later. But on the web, you can set the width for, of the screen, and you can change inside the picture attribute, you can change which image is shown. And so what I did is if it's, if the width is up to 480 pixels, it's a smaller image. And so the image will always fit and be properly sized on the web page. <clears throat> and if you actually open up this web page and you start moving the browser back and forth, it will download the different photos as you scroll back and forth. And I did a really cute thing where I made it sepia here and not sepia here and sepia there, so you can see the picture would change color as I zoomed in. But we can, if you're interested, I can show it to you at the break. So, second part of the uh, images is animated GIFs. And let's see if this, let's hope this plays. It's not going to, because I changed the computer. But you'll see it in a second. This is a picture of one of our goats in Seattle. This is, this is Nora. Your goat? Yes. <laughs> we have goats. Who's taking care of the goat now? Uh, we have some friends taking care of the goats. <laughs> we, have, we have four or five goats. Um, because people keep giving us goats. <laughs> it's the weirdest thing. <laughs> um, all right. So the original image here was 1.4 megabytes, but I thought this is going to play here. So I made an animated GIF of the goat eating, because that's adorable, right? The problem with animated GIFs is, well, they're awesome, right? You see them everywhere. This is now 256 colors, because GIF only allows you to have 256 colors. Um, but it's 3.8 megabytes. So it's actually 270% larger than the movie that I took on my phone. And the reason that is, is the way animated GIFs work is it's like a flip book. You know, we have a bunch of images and you flip it. There are 35 images of the goat and they're just playing one after another after another. And this, and you know, video compresses through time as well. So that's why video files compress a lot better than animated GIFs. And so, what can you do if you want animated GIFs? Because everybody loves animated GIFs. You want them in your app. You want to you know, send them out on Twitter or whatever. Um, so what I did is I made this video. I made it into a video, and it's not going to play because machines. Um, but if I take the video and I make it 256 colors, it becomes 250 kilobytes, um, which is really, really great because everyone wants to see more pictures of goats. Um, now, one of the problems with using a video, and so what you can do with the video is then you set it to autoplay into loop, 
and it'll just autoplay and loop. Um, on mobile, you have to add muted. If you just say autoplay on Chrome or Safari on, on, on a smartphone, it won't play automatically. You have to say muted as well. And I think that's so that when you're in class and you're watching videos that it doesn't get really, really loud. So it, for it to autoplay on a web page, it has to be muted. And so, you know, you, you can put that on your web page, it'll play the goats. Um, but video tags are slow. And so there's a blog post down here. But what happens is the video tag is loaded, but then it postpones the load of the video file until everything else is loaded on the page. And so it actually takes longer for that this movie animated GIF to appear on the screen. However, things are changing. And there's this blog post talks about it. But in the Safari preview, you can actually now use MP4s inside the picture tag. And so this is good if it's used wisely. So if you have something like the GOAT, which is 250 kilobytes, it'll autoplay and just loop and loop and loop. But if you put a two-hour movie in there, it's also just going to play that entire movie forever. And so you probably don't want to do that. But um, it's pretty cool because the image tag loads immediately, and those files are loaded immediately as well. <coughs> and so that is now in, um, it's in the preview for, um, for Safari, and I think it's coming to Chrome. So this is something to look forward to in the future. How am I doing on time? Are we okay? Yeah. All right, I'm going to talk a little bit about video. I know I've got, I've got way too much content for 45 minutes, but... Um, but so the way video works, and I'm going to talk a little bit about video streaming. Um, I actually don't think that half of all web pages are video. I think it's sort of the law of averages. They're using averages. And so there are a couple websites that have like 500 megabytes of video, and it's just throwing the whole average off across all the millions of websites. Um, but the way video streaming works is the first request that's made for a video file is a manifest. And that manifest file says, I have five different qualities of video. Um, here are the different streams that you can request. And so then the player says, ah, I want this one. And then that stream has a manifest that lists all the different pieces of video. And so the way video streaming works is it sends two seconds at a time, or five seconds at a time. So it can start playing those chunks of video while it's still downloading the rest of the video. And so it starts playing right away. You don't have to download the whole movie. Um, so the player begins downloading segments, and then the movie plays. And this is something that you want to have happen really fast, because all of the research that I talked about, about fast web pages and fast native apps, is the same for video. As soon as it takes over three seconds for a video to load, people start abandoning the video. And it's different. So if it's pictures of a cat on a Roomba, and it's three seconds, people will give up. But if you're watching a movie, you might, you know, I'm, I'm going to spend an hour and a half watching a movie. You might be okay with 15 or 20 seconds just because it's a movie. Um, so uh, people have different, they will wait longer for, depending on what type of video it is. If it's 15 seconds for like a 20 second video of a cat doing something silly, eventually you give up. Um, I find myself doing that. I'm like, why did I click that? Like, what am I, no, I've got to go like, spend time with my family or something. Um, but then when the video is playing, if the network throughput changes, right? If the network gets better quality, the player may actually ask for a, more high, a higher quality stream because we can get better looking video on the screen. Or if you end up going into a tunnel or somewhere where there's bad coverage, it may throttle down to a lower bandwidth. To keep the video playing, the quality may not look as good, but the video will keep playing. And so, there's sort of this ongoing thing while a video is playing. And so I want to walk through a couple examples of some of this that I've seen in Video Optimizer. <clears throat> and so this is the initial manifest file. And each one of these lines is a different stream. And so you can see two, four, six, eight. This video has eight different streams up on the server, so you can watch it. <clears throat> what the player does initially, how does it pick it doesn't really know what the throughput of the network is, so how does it know what to do? And in HLS streaming, it does something really smart, and it picks the first one. You've got to do something. 
Um, and so in this case, it picks an 8.5 megabit per second stream, which as you might imagine, won't look very good for a lot of people on mobile, or it'll take a long time to download. It'll look really good, because it's 1920 by 1080, but 8.5 megabits per second is gonna take a long time to download on some mobile connections. Like, if you're on a fast Wi-Fi, you're probably fine, but on 3G, that's gonna be horrible. Um, what I often see is that uh, they pick something a little more middle of the road, like 1.2 megabytes, and so it'll be complete. If you look, this one is out of order. The highest, it's 200,400. It's increasing, but they put the highest one here. And normally I see something a little more middle of the road, and so the balance there is how fast can I get the video to start up? If it's 1.2 megabits per second and we need five <coughs> seconds of video, that's gonna be a lot faster than 8.5 megabits per second. Um, so that's generally what I see, and that is the balance between how fast I can get the video to start up and the quality. I mean, you may say 640 by 360 isn't great quality. Maybe, maybe you'd want to be a little higher, uh, but I'll talk a little bit more about some other interesting things with this video stream as well. If we graph the eight streams that are available, you can see that there's a lot at low bandwidths, and there's a lot at high throughputs. But there's sort of a huge gap right there. And when you have large gaps in video streaming, you end up coming into places where you can get into stalling. Um, because the video, and, and you'll actually see this happen in this, in this stream as I'm testing it. But the player, wants, the player wants as high quality as possible, but it can't quite handle three and a half megabits per second. Um, so you can lead to streaming issues. So you kind of want this to be smooth. So like one more, if they had one more stream right there, they would probably do a lot better. Um, and so I'm gonna walk through what happened. And so each segment is numbered. So the zero segment is the beginning of the movie, and then it's one, two, three, four, five, and each one of these is five seconds of movie. So at this point, we've downloaded 20 seconds of movie. And you can see on my mobile phone, it can't handle this 8.5 megabit per second. And it, the player quickly says, whoa, that's too much. Let's drop way down here. Because that's way too high. I don't know what's good, but we're gonna try this. And it downloads three segments. And then the player's like, I think we can do better than that. I think we can get better quality to the customer. Let's see what we can do. And it jumps up to this, oh, two clicks, I did. It jumps up to three and a half megabits per second. And what you can see here is segment three is downloaded twice. And that's not a bad thing because if the new version shows up, it's gonna be a higher quality version for the end user. So yeah, some of this data is wasted, but you're gonna get a higher quality video on the screen for those five seconds. But it turns out that my network couldn't handle three and a half megabits per second and it dropped down to 1.2. But then it went back up to three and a half, and then it went back down to 1.2, and we kind of get this ping pong effect back and forth as the quality is changing. And as a customer, you might actually be able to see the resolution changing every three to five seconds in the movie, <coughs> and that might be really annoying. And one thing you don't want the video to be is annoying, right? The videos are supposed to be entertaining to the people who are watching them. The other thing to notice is if you start looking at the network traffic, segment three, or segment four was downloaded here at quality 540, but when it jumped down, it downloaded it at the lower, at the lower quality. And then five and six were downloaded here at this quality once, and then again at the same quality. So it ends up being wasted data. So that's costing the, the the, obviously the video delivery from their CDN, they're paying for all that data to come out of their servers and their network. Um, but it also just, you know, that's megabytes and megabytes of extra data that's costing the customers. Um, and it's probably all just because of this big jump right here. So, I'm at the end. I appreciate you all listening. So we talked a little bit about different ways you can uh, speed up your mobile performance by using CDNs and reducing the number of redirects um, in the delivery speed. And then content delivery, we can do text compression, we can optimize the images through 
size and quality and format, responsive images. I could talk for hours on that. Um, I'd be happy to later. And then also you can optimize the way the video is sent on mobile on any device to make sure the streaming works as well as it does. Um, here are a bunch of the tools. I'm going to put this deck up. I'm going to share the deck so it'll get posted on the website so you can get all this stuff. Um, but they're all <coughs> web page tests and website speed tests are free to use and they grade your um, application and your images. This is the tool I work on, uh, Video Optimizer. You can get it at att.com slash video optimizer. Uh, this is the book I wrote a few years ago, and that's a link to the PDF. So if you're interested, you definitely can go and download the PDF of my book. Um, it only goes up to Android Marshmallow, but all of the stuff I talk about still holds all the way through. And then Cloudinary has a bunch of things for images, and I thought I'd put the links up there. Um, when I was showing this, I wanted to run all of those links and everything by Cloudinary to make sure I was doing the right thing. And they actually offered to a contest for everybody here at, 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 at the, the GGG include Tripoca. Test your app website, optimize it, test it again to see what improvement you could make over you know a, a couple hours or a couple whatever. Um, what kind of optimizations you can see in your application or website so you can test it with web page test or video optimizer, any of the tools I showed you before. And then I put it together a Google form. You could submit it and they're going to give away a prize to uh, whoever has the most optimized website. So if you guys are interested, feel free to enter in that. Um, and if you have any questions or any trouble with any of the tooling, you can hit me up on Twitter or send me an email and we can work out any issues that you might have. Um, and with that, I'm done. So thank you very much for listening. I appreciate it. Yes. Uh, you're basically working for ATP, which is the provider, right? It's a network provider. Mm -hmm. They're right. Uh, you're selling also for uh, end customers, also for companies, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, let's say um, I'm a, I don't know, who is coming to you to optimize their apps? Their um... so what we did, and this is actually pretty cool, I think is we open source the tool. So we're giving away the tool to the developer community. And the reason we did that is um, we wanted to be very open about what kind of data we're collecting and how we're collecting it so anyone can look at the code and see what we're doing. Um, but what we were able to tell the executive leadership at at and is if we sold this tool for 50 bucks or 100 bucks or 500 bucks to developers, we would probably make 500 bucks. Um, but if I can take 1% of Facebook's data off the AT&T network, that's like exabytes of data, right, over a year. And if I can make Netflix 1% more efficient, the amount of data that gets taken off the network means that AT&T doesn't have to build their network. As, they don't have to keep growing as fast and it actually saves the company a lot more money. And so what, they, what we've decided to do is give the tool away. And so we reach out to top developers. You know, it's not a surprise we reach out to Snapchat or to Facebook because it's on a lot of people's phones. And if I can make images on Facebook 5% more efficient or 1% more efficient or even a hundredth of a percent more efficient, it's going to be so much data off of the network. It's going to make so many apps faster that it's actually good for AT&T. The other interesting research, and I know this is a really long answer, and I'm sorry. Um, when, in, when your phone is slow, customers don't blame the app, they blame your carrier. <laughs> it's true. Yes. Dang it. Why is my phone so slow? I pay them so much money every month, but it's, a lot of times it's the app. So. It's, there's sort of this perception thing that we can do too. So if I can make Facebook faster and 90% of AT&T customers have Facebook on their phone, right? <laughs> it's it's also with the unlimited plan, right? When you don't have to pay for your data. There are a lot of, so that is something, is that growing here too? I know it's yes, getting yes, very good. Yeah. Um, and so in some ways you don't care about data as much, but you probably still care about battery life and things like that. So. And you care about how fast those apps take to load. So if we can make the apps load faster, um, 
and I, I, I talked to a lot of the developers, and they're like, but unlimited, we can use all the data we want, we can just do whatever, and then, but I'm like, but it's gonna slow down your site so much that no one's gonna visit it anymore. <laughs> Whatever you want to do. <laughs> Ooh, thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you.